I'm Evelyn Kalb, interviewing her. Welcome to Evie's History Bites, hosted by Martha Owen, the Heritage Collection Manager at the Evelyn Lehman Kalb Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center. Welcome to a brand new episode of Evie's History Bites. I'm Martha, your host, and we have a great episode for you. We are doing a part two about Emma Schrock. I have Emma's niece, Alita, back on the podcast to talk about her aunt, and I also have Dr. Simon Bronner from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee on this episode. But before we get to them, let's have a little history lesson. Emma Schrock could be thought of as the Grandma Moses of Elkhart County. She grew up Old Order Mennonite and started painting in her night in her 40s. It is thought that during her career she painted over 2,000 paintings. She was born with physical challenges and never let those define her. In 1961, her sister-in-law Irene Schrock gave her a Connie Gordon's "You Can Paint a Picture" book. Emma experienced experimented with the book's techniques and started her artistic adventures and that led to the creating the art that eventually made her popular she loved to paint landscapes but also painted scenes directly out of her experiences Schrock once said i live what i paint and i paint what i see Emma's first attempt of exhibiting and selling her work outside of her home came in 1965 at the Pletcher Village Art Festival, later known as the Amish Acres Arts and Crafts Festival in downtown Napanee. In 2021, the Napanee, the Evelyn Lehman Culp Heritage Collection officially opened their Doug Grant Family Gallery, the Emma Schrock Collection, making it one of the largest privately owned Emma, collection of Emma Schrocks to be on display. Along with the Evelyn Lehman Culp Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center, the Midwest Museum of American Art in Elkhart, Goshen College, and Indiana University, Bloomington, also have collections of Emma Schrock paintings. I sat down with Alita Schrock and we talked about her Aunt Emma. All right. So thank you so much, Alita, for being, for sitting down with me. Um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, and well, my name's Alita Schrock and I am um, Emma Schrock's niece. My dad was her youngest brother, Henry. And actually she was, I think, 14 when he was born. So oh, wow. he was quite a bit younger. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, I grew up close to their house. My cousins lived on a farm across the street from where they lived and we just lived like, I don't know, three-tenths of a mile down the road. So we were just constantly back and forth um, between my cousins and my grandparents um, throughout the week. Mm -hmm. And um, their place was kind of like home to us. All right, um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about your Aunt Emma? Um, she really was the life of the family. She had um, a great personality as far as she was more very talkative and, and outgoing. And she loved us kids. She was, ne because of her handicap, she never did marry and she was at home all the time. And so every time we went to, we called them Grest Studies, her, mm -hmm. my grandparents. And every time we went down to Grest Studies, she was there and she loved playing with us so i think all of us cousins probably felt like we were one of her favorites so mm -hmm. <laughs> it so i read somewhere that she would paint on clear glass piggy banks um and give them to newborns in her church community which being the old order mennonite uh church community so do you know how the community received or cherished them um everybody loved them um she gave them to us, my cousins, her nieces and nephews, she gave it to us when we were born. And I was actually talking with some of my cousins. We were trying to remember whether she gave it as like a baby gift to other families uh -huh. or whether they um, came and bought it. But I do know it was kind of like a an expected thing, almost like that, oh, you know, we had a baby, you get a, um, a little piggy bank. Some people I think might have just brought their own piggy bank. They might have had a larger one mm -hmm. and had her write um, their child's name on it. But yeah, people loved it. It was. Yeah. All right. Um, 
so I know that she actually loved to paint landscapes and I've seen we have one in our collection and then I've seen many of hers online that have been popping up at auctions and things like that so why didn't she paint more landscapes yeah she loved it would have been her preference to paint landscapes she loved doing it but it's not what sold and mm -hmm. she was very much about pleasing you know the customers and so she painted what they wanted and she painted a lot of symbols um, into her paintings like the bug like uh, buggies windmills plain clothing and white houses but and I know that all of the significance of that but what was the significance of green blinds? Yeah, um, growing up, we always had green blinds in our house, and I think pretty much all my friends and everyone did. And I was actually trying to figure that one out for sure. Um, but these, when I talked with my cousins about it, the, these are kind of the ideas we came up with. Mm -hmm. um, one thing is there were serviceable dark colors. They, it kept the sun out when you wanted it, you know, and if at night it didn't allow, you know, the people to see in and actually see like a shadow of a person and like that. But also we don't know. It's like, is that kind of what was on sale back then? Uh -huh. Or, and, but I do know back then it was discouraged to have like drapes or anything like that. Um, they people would have like a little ruffle of a curtain maybe above their kitchen sink or like in the bedroom you would have like a ruffle at the bottom to hide uh, people inside and then a curtain a gr one of the green curtains at the top to pull down but in the other rooms it was like living rooms and stuff most people just had the green pull shades um, I think it was probably just a custom, mm -hmm. um, a simplicity, because they wanted to be a, have a simple life, um, different from the world. I know nowadays it's slowly changing a little bit where s more people have like curtains that they'll make and hang. Yeah. But a lot of them still have green blinds. Okay. Oh, yeah, because I, I noticed a lot of green blinds mm -hmm. in the paintings, and then um, I was reading Dr. Bronner's book, Grasping Things, and he also mentioned that in there. Um, so that that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and I was when I was talking with my cousins about it, we were kind of like, well, that's just what we had. Yeah. You know, it's like when you grow up with it, it's you don't think about it being that different, but you're right. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everybody I knew had the green blinds. All right. Um, so um, Emma had a unique way of titling her paintings to really reflect like what was going on in them like there's barn raising the auction house um one of my favorites is one of our smaller paintings that's like the deserted beauty oh yeah um so it's like the deserted buildings um so can you explain why some of emma's paintings were titled and named and um some were signed or yeah some were titled and named and then some signed, and then some with no signature. That, I can't tell you for sure, but I think it was probably just that at first she would just paint and kind of forget about signing her name and didn't really realize the importance of it mm -hmm. is what I'm assuming it is. I do know that she had a um, small picture that she had painted of my cousin's farm that was just a little down the road from them. And she had that hanging in her bedroom studio. And she never intended to sell that one. And that one, my cousin has it now, and it doesn't have her name on it. So we were just assuming, well, she never planned to sell it, so she might not have put her name on. But some of the others, I, I'm i just assuming she didn't think, she forgot, just uh -huh. got busy and, yeah. Interesting. And, um, You've, you've kind of explained this to me before, um, but I, I've heard that some people have the signature Aunt Emma on their um, paintings. Can you kind of dive into that for me? So, um, she would give all of my cousins and I, all her nieces and nephews, like gifts on our birthdays and Christmas and stuff. And for the most part, it was stuff that she had made is what she would give us. And so she would sometimes not always but sometimes sign that aunt emma but i was curious do you know is there anything like that out in the public or is it um how i found out about the signature aunt emma was from a um 
program that the Midwest Museum of American Art did in the early 2000s. Okay. And uh, this lady actually had a painting that was signed to Aunt Emma. Okay. That an actual like the original. Yeah, an okay. original painting. That is interesting. Um, because to my knowledge, she only signed it like for when she actually gave her nieces and nephews something. But mm-hmm. that would be interesting to see that sometime. I have no idea. It surprises me. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to track it down for you. Yeah. Um, thanks. So Emma really never desired um, for the fame and popularity. So do you know how um, she handled it, or? Um, did the popularity really come after she passed away? Um, the really, the greatest popularity came after she passed away, but even though while she was living, she had people stopping in there frequently that, I mean, mm-hmm. not just old order Mennonites or other, you know, Mennonites or the neighborhood, but she had people from actually around the country stopping in sometimes. And I think she was such a down-to-earth person and the culture itself is so down-to-earth and pride is something that's um, really looked down upon Mm -hmm. so to her this was just what she did because it was what she was able to do and she enjoyed doing it and it's just yeah I think (laughs) the person her personality and the culture itself the and the religion just kind of made her very down-to-earth all right yeah um I was reading in Dr. Bronner's book how um, she really struggled with paintings that weren't about her lifestyle. Like she couldn't, she struggled with figures and she struggled with um, painting something other than a farmhouse and a barn. So I, that's that's interesting. I, I didn't know. I mean, I know she if people brought her a picture. Uh-huh. She would paint whatever they wanted, but I, I wasn't aware that she really struggled with it. But I, I can believe that because it, it didn't just flow out of who she was. At the at your grandparents' um, home place, they never had a sign outside to advertise her work for sale. And she never really advertised her paintings um, being because since her paintings weren't sold in galleries. So how did people really find her? Well, my assumptions are, I mean, it started with, you know, people from the church knowing and then um, neighborhood. And, but then she used to, when she was still fairly young, um, I'm saying young, she in her teens and 20s, she would go up to the Wakarusa Sale Barn. It was on State Road 19, close to the corner of um, County Road 40. And there's a restaurant called Raymond's Restaurant. I don't know if that was there, but there was a sale barn somewhere in that general area. Okay. And she used to take her things up there on Saturdays when they had a sale. And she, mm-hmm. they would just set up, people would set up booths outdoors. Uh-huh. And some days it rained and, <laughs> um, and like that. But some of my older cousins, I never went with her there. I don't remember it. But some of my cousins who were older than I am would help her, like, carry the boxes of things and unpack it onto the table and pack mm-hmm. it back up and stuff. And then she also used to go to the um, art festivals that they had in Napanee. Okay. So I, I think it was like pre um, Ami Shakers. It would have just been wherever out in the street or wherever oh, they had yeah, the... they, it would have been across the street from our building okay. actually. Yeah. Is that where it would have been? All right. Mm-hmm. And I know she used to come there. I think my mom came with her one time and sometimes some of my older cousins um, came with her. And Plus, like, Dr. Abel was her doctor, and uh-huh. he made house calls, so he would come out to her home and stuff, and so he always saw whatever she was painting at the moment, and so I'm assuming that it's just through those avenues that mm-hmm. people got to know her. Interesting. We, we've kind of talked about this in the, in the past, um, but what does it mean to your family and you to have exhibits such as our Grant Family Gallery? Um, and other exhibits like what the Midwest Museum of Art does since they have a collection and I know IU um, with the former Mathers Museum did exhibits about your aunt. Um, so like, how does it feel for your family to have things dedicated to her, your aunt and her work? For me personally, I'm glad that she's not being forgotten. Um, she deserves to be remembered. 
um, because of the spirit of who she was, where she overcame so much and mm -hmm. just had a positive attitude towards life. Um, a lot of my family, it doesn't really mean a lot to because Again, I think it goes back to the culture of where you don't want to build a person up into being prideful. So it's just kind of a thing of it is. Yeah. And they have nothing against it. They're okay with it. But it's, and like they, my cousins came to see the museum. They wanted to see it. So mm -hmm. yes, in that sense, they're glad for it. But it's not like it really means that much to them. Though I do know like when we came, like Emma's um, wheelchair is here. Yeah. And we didn't know, none of us knew what had happened with that wheelchair. So we came here and we saw it and suddenly all the memories of it, of growing up, it was in this little shed. It was a two-story shed uh, close to my grandparents' house. And so when we were kids, we would climb up the ladder into the second floor of that shed, uh -huh. and her wheelchair was up there. So we'd sit in there and kind of push each other around <laughs> and play with it. So to come here and suddenly see that, all that nostalgia of like, this is our play toy. You know, <laughs> how did that um, get here? So that was... Um, an interesting feeling it was and and then I know a lot of the the paintings we mm -hmm. there's some of them that we look at and it's like oh man we wish we had that one you know that we could yeah. hang that one in our house um growing up Emma I mean we were always there it was just Emma the paintings were just such a part of our life mm -hmm. that we we got some of them that she gave us for gifts and I bought like um I was a teacher in at a Mennonite school in Ohio in my 20s and so I had her paint a picture of my school and I had her paint a picture of my house that I got and my mom had bought a couple of them that she gave to me when she retired but so I have some of those things but at the same time when I see certain pictures now as an adult I'm mm -hmm. like oh man why didn't I get her to make one like that for me you know <laughs> it's, it's, so it's kind of a, a nostalgic feeling for all of us seeing her paintings and just being reminded of her and yeah who she what she meant to us yeah, growing and I, up I, I know every single time when I'm in the gallery and I'm looking at the paintings I always see something new mm -hmm. um, the, yeah. and even my dad commented one one day when he was in here at the museum, uh, he looked at the barn, our barn raising one, mm -hmm. and he's like, that looks like a little bit too many people up there on that <laughs> roof. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. And because I know sometimes the more things she put into it, the better it sold. Yeah. So I don't know if a few less would have caused it to not sell as well or not. But yeah, she did put lots of them on. That's true. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And um, I was just at the learner last week for um, a conference that they were having there. Mm -hmm. And they actually have an Emma in their main um, gap, in their main uh, foyer. It's it's a large one, isn't it? Yeah. I did see it. I forgot though which one it is. Um, I think it's a barn raising one. Okay. Yeah. I do remember seeing one hanging there. Yeah. yeah. So I, I joked that I, I couldn't, I can't ever get away from Emma. Like <laughs> she's, she's everywhere. She's everywhere. Um, yeah. and always being remembered. Um, and hopefully we can keep her um, legacy alive. I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but um, we had a lady who um, we have out on our museum sign, we have mm -hmm. Emma Schrock Art Gallery. Um, we had a lady stop in from Iowa mm -hmm. and um, she saw our sign and she's like, I have, Emma's, I have Emma Schrock paintings of my own. Um, just because she reminds me of Grandma Moses, and I can afford Emma Shock paintings where I can't, can't afford, afford. <laughs> Grandma Moses. <laughs> but she was really excited to find us and to be able to see more of what your aunt painted. Oh, that's a cool story. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. And uh, we've actually had people come in from Massachusetts, too, so we have we joke that we have a Grandma Moses and they have a Grandma Moses. So <laughs> they, they, they get a kick out of that, too. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we really didn't talk about? Um, I know just that a lot of people, they look at her as Emma the artist. Mm -hmm. And to me and to my cousins, she's, she's Emma, our aunt. She's still in our hearts, still so much a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, that I'm, I'm glad that her art can go on like it is. So thank you for what you guys are doing for that. 
Yeah, well, and thank you so much for sharing your stories with us and always answering my questions when I when I come up with them. Um, and I know for us, it's an honor to have the gallery here and to be able to share her story as um, many other people, many other places don't share her story the way that we do. Yeah, thank you. I do, I do like the way you guys do it. It's And the display, the room where art is in, it's very beautifully done. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much, Alita, for, for joining me. And I really appreciate you and um, getting to know you more. Thank you. I always enjoy talking with you here. I connected with Dr. Simon Bronner over Zoom, and we talked about Emma Schrock and her role in the folk art world. So thank you so much, Dr. Bronner, for being um, on our podcast with us. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. It's great to be here. And I grew up in New York City, and then I wanted to get away from the city, and I went to upstate New York, uh, far more rural. Mm -hmm. to study at Binghamton University. And then I had an opportunity to work for the New York State Historical Association and got to know a lot of rural counties and uh, had valuable courses there in folk art and folk culture, which set me on my path. And then the main place to go at that time was Indiana University mm -hmm. to continue that study. And I also had a major in American studies as well. And I was uh, particularly devoted to Indiana and took to it. I did my dissertation on Southern Indiana woodcarvers, and then also got the opportunity to do research on Mennonite and, and Amish culture in Northern Indiana. And most of my teaching career was at Penn State. And then I moved up into administration. Now I'm a dean at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And nonetheless, I try to keep uh, my hand in scholarship yeah. and, and still uh, connect to the publishing world as, as well as to the folklore world. Okay. Um, so you do, you said that you focus on wood carvers, but then you also focus on like folk art. Um, so what interested you in that? Well, I can say that one of the valuable courses that I mentioned was on genre painting, which are depictions of everyday life. And the point of the course is to talk about paintings as documents of social history. And since your podcast is devoted to history, mm -hmm. I would strongly mm -hmm. encourage that still. I don't think paintings have been given the attention that they should uh, as documents mm -hmm. and especially valuable for everyday life and particularly for communities that might be outside of the urban areas and and the mainstream it was a great course unusual i think in a lot of art historical curricula and it was uh, taught by someone who also had an interest in folk art who pointed to folk art as especially valuable because then you get a grassroots view of everyday mm -hmm. life. And I remember that he showed paintings of someone by the name of Queen of Stovall in Virginia. And when I ran across Emma Schrock's paintings at the Indiana University Museum, I thought, oh, this looks a lot like that. And I <laughs> wanted to know more. It really caught my eye because of that experience at the uh, Fenmore House Art Museum, as well as uh, in this course at the New York State Historical Association. All right. And um, you mentioned Emma Schrock, and uh, we have a large collection of Emma Schrocks. We're probably the largest private collection owned in the state of Indiana, um, topping out at 60 paintings. Mm. Um, but how did you meet or become acquainted with Emma Schrock? I was new to Indiana University and I got a job, which I was very grateful for at the Indiana U Museum of History, Anthropology and Folklore, as it was called then. Now it's the Mathers Museum. And I was a cataloger. 
So I would sit there all day looking at objects and uh, writing them down and inventorying them. And a lot of them are nothing to write home about, so to speak. (laughs) Uh, They were pretty routine. And then these paintings were in a pile Mm -hmm. uh, with my responsibility to document them. And I looked them over and again, they reminded me of other paintings and I got curious. I saw that their origins were in Northern Indiana and there was a name and I wanted to know more. Mm -hmm. You should know that Emma Schrock did document her own work. And so she had an address on there. (laughs) So I wrote her and she wrote back right away, very welcoming. And I asked, could I come up and talk to you? Because that's what folklorists do. Mm -hmm. They engage in field work and interviews and Uh, She was thrilled to have someone pay attention to her. And it was the start of many visits that I would take up there. It was a long drive, but it was uh, really worthwhile and opened my vistas. And readers should also know that she was an avid letter writer. That's a lost start these days. Yeah. And I would hope that with your collection, you might have some supplemental materials, uh, uh, particularly her her letters, which were a joy. And she would tell me about everyday life, how her family was, what, how she was uh, feeling. She was quite reflective. Um, so you wrote both an article about Emma Schrock, as well as including her in um, your book, Grasping Things. Mm-hmm. So what is her importance to the folk art world? At the time that I was writing about folk art, there was a raging debate Mm -hmm. between folklorists and really art collectors at the time of whether paintings were folk art, because the feeling was that crafts were more in line with the traditional and they want the folklorists wanted to define folk as traditional work. So wood carving, frock tour, Mm -hmm. making this uh, kind of thing. It could be decorative, but it was based on work that was handed down from one generation to the other. The art collectors tended to define folk art as things that were naive or primitive, that were Mm self-taught. And as I talked to Emma more and more about her influences, it became apparent to me that she saw herself continuing a craft. She saw it as work. Mm -hmm. This was not a hobby for her. She did learn from other people. So there was a traditional aspect, and yet she was also creative Mm -hmm. in what she did. So I think the importance of her paintings and particularly the writing that I was doing at the time that was getting attention was this idea that you could have folk painting and a folk painter be thought of in a traditional kind of manner. And after that, others have cited the work as a foundation for analyzing and interpreting other kinds of genre painters Mm -hmm. and whether they were indeed folk in the sense of traditional or whether they were in a a different kind of category. Uh, These days, there's this idea of visionary artists and self-taught artists. Yeah, I think uh, Emma Schrock clearly... Uh, was in a folk art category and just an artist, period. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, she was. Um, So we've talked previously that you actually have a collection yourself of Emma Schrock paintings. Can you just tell us a little bit about your favorite pieces in your collection? Sure. Well, actually, behind me, it is uh, labeled the busy season because here in the dean's office, 
It seems like <laughs> every day is the busy season, but it also yeah. depicts her house, which I enjoyed visiting, and her family was very kind to me as well. So I have wonderful memories of going to Goshen and seeing her and traveling in northern Indiana. I also have, though, at home, a, a painting that probably has more personal meanings because of what I said about her letters and how mm -hmm. they, to me, were the liveliest reading I had all through graduate <laughs> school. It's called Waiting for the Mail. And okay. It is also a picture of that house that's there mm -hmm. in this painting, but it shows this little figure. In, <laughs> in the doorway waiting for the male deliverer to mm -hmm. come because since she was had physical challenges, the male was really her communication, her contact with the world. And, and she loved writing letters and she loved even more receiving letters. So I was glad to bring her a little joy. And I can say she brought me joy too. And that uh, painting has a very prominent place in my house. There are others that I certainly enjoy a lot because of my affinity for everyday life and for farm life and and for folk life. So she had paintings such as the quilting that mm -hmm. she had that is a very famous folk art and and traditional art. She had one on harvesting. She had maple sugaring, which mm -hmm. is, as you know, in Indiana is something that a lot of local people are very proud of, but it, they are also uh, threatened kinds of crafts and, and folk knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, and she brought that alive, I think for me and uh, for many other people. And it's one of those social history documents now that I think of of old order Mennonite life and northern mm -hmm. Indiana life in general at the time that I was there in the 1970s. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that she loved actually painting landscapes yes. and um, things like that, but she soon figured that she couldn't sell that <laughs> at all. Um, I have actually seen some of her landscapes um at auctions and they're gorgeous so it, it kind of is weird that they never sold um as well as depicting her life did um, yeah and i think that was uh, part of her love of being out of the house she was confined uh, because of her disability and so one of the other painting in my office, which you can't see, is called the Evening Ride. And I think she really loved those rides out in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And that's where she got the inspiration for those landscapes. So I don't want to psychoanalyze too much, but I, <laughs> yeah. I think part of her reason for loving her landscapes and even for painting everyday life, but would have a very vivid horizon if mm -hmm. you will, is because of this idea that, that she was getting out and uh, truly enjoying nature and all that it had to bring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the more that I, the more that I like analyze our paintings and things like that, I do know that her favorite color was pink. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of pink in her uh, paintings, but there are also little girls wearing pink dresses. So do you think that that was, Emma as a way of painting herself into her paintings? She did. Certainly she was in waiting for the mail. Mm -hmm. You can't make out a face. And, and generally she really didn't paint faces, whether that was because of the Anabapist uh, stricture on, on graven images or not. Um, I think that, that it was intentional in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, but she also had a she had a fun creative streak. So she yes, her painting she wanted to depict everyday life and the joy in work and mm -hmm. everyday life, but they were colorful. And yeah, you know, part of the other thing about the impact of her paintings that you had asked about in the folk art world, mm -hmm. well, in I would say in the Mennonite world. 
<laughs> she brought out that you can have color in in mm -hmm. your life and especially with the values that they represent so that there should not be the stereotype that it's all dark and dismal and, and yeah. work her she was accepted in the community because she did treat it as work mm -hmm. and in fact she had different audiences when you say about landscapes another kind of painting that she did that she tended not to sell to people who came around were these farmscapes so uh, she would have Mennonite neighbors mm -hmm. for whom she would do actually a genre that is much older and that is of the farmscape so these days farmers will often have an aerial photograph of their farm and, and hang that up well the Mennonites aren't going to do that yeah. So she provided these paintings that the English used to provide of of their farms that often had that landscape and celebrating the farm as a home as well as an institution. All right. Um, so Emma Schrock asked you to use a pseudonym when you wrote about yeah. her. Did she come up with that name or did you? I did. And... Mm -hmm. She had fun with it. She liked it. <laughs> there were a few letters in which she signed it, Anna Bach. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, and I suppose local people would know who she was, but that was uh, just part of the humility that she practiced from Mennonite mm -hmm. values and incorporated into her life. And I thought Anna Bach, is a name that sounds Mennonite without yeah. drawing specific attention to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. And it, it was really interesting with, with Emma Schrock, like she never advertised to sell her paintings or no. anything like that. And the English would just show up at their house. Um, so I've always thought that that was interesting. I've um, watched oral history events that are, uh, another art museum has done and um they really put her on a pedestal and like idolize her in a sense yes but i i would hope they would also interpret her from her life and that's what i was after in my mm -hmm. research and writing if you take those paintings out of context in the indiana university museum as i said they look like somebody's homemade art mm -hmm. right but then yeah. when you talk to her or when i talk to her a whole life came out that made those paintings uh, truly meaningful for me and also mm -hmm. explain the meaning for her yeah we do have some of the stories behind a few of our probably about i think about 15 of our paintings we actually have the stories behind them so those right. are the ones that are um, probably like our most talk that we talk to people the most about just because we know um, her story behind them. Like we have um, we have a triptych. So it's a it's a three panels and um, but is her outside of her bedroom window. So outside of her studio. And um, a lot of people ask us about that because it is like like you said, a farmscape. It's not really depicting any life. Yeah. And her studio was right in her front room. Mm -hmm. So it was another way in which she looked out on the world through her art, but also uh, through her window. Yeah. And that's also how she would see if people were coming to the door. Mm -hmm. Um. So in your book, Grasping Things, in the epilogue, you include a story about Emma Schrock and how she was upset to find out that someone was selling note cards of her work. Do you have like any other stories similar to that? Well, she was concerned, certainly, about commercial exploitation mm -hmm. because I think she did want to connect to people. And even though it sounds strange to have people just ring her doorbell and ask, can I see your art? That's mm -hmm. the kind of connection she wanted. She wasn't someone who 
wanted a gallery show or Mm -hmm. was upset because she wasn't invited by a gallery or something like that. But the limit on that was there was a case of somebody who I told about her art and because Emma wanted to sell some things said, uh, you know, you can buy some things if you're interested because at the time I was a poor graduate student, it was difficult (laughs) for me. So I was also interested if other people would buy, but this Mm -hmm. person who was employed actually for Indiana university, I went to see her on a Sunday, which made her upset and put her in a difficult position. So this is where Mennonite values on hospitality clashed Mm -hmm. with religious values. So what she did as a compromise was that she gave her the painting and then said, though, I I can't take your money because it's Sabbath. Mm Mm-hmm. So send it to me later. So, I mean, that's the kind of trusting soul that she was. And I think that person did do that. But again, she could have been (laughs) exploited (laughs) for that. I don't know if in the after that, whether she just stopped taking people on a on a Sunday Mm -hmm. or or whatever, or just closed that off. But I know she wrote me and uh, said that was uh, very uncomfortable for her. Yeah, and I, I, I did read your book, Grasping Things, and uh, one of the things that interested me was Emma really couldn't draw like a normal house because you had put in there a story about um, your friend who they wanted her to paint their house. Right. So. Yeah, and she did have trouble with figures as, as well. Uh, and when I say that she learned from other people, it wasn't from an art class Mm -hmm. that's not what she did but because the Mennonite world has strong connections to Lancaster and to Holmes County as well as to the Elkhart, Goshen, uh, those areas of Napanee, uh, northern Indiana when they would visit and visiting was a real social occasion and that's what they did they didn't go out to do touristy things they really visited socially they would compare notes and she would talk about a relative who lived in Lancaster who she would see would paint on glass which Mm -hmm. again is an old German kind of skill it's difficult to paint on glass and so she learned how to work with colors how to mix colors how to work on certain kinds of materials. She painted on wood as well yeah. as canvas. I don't know if you have plaques that she made there. I also like them a lot because my folklore interest, she would paint proverbs on mm-hmm. these heart-shaped plaques as well. Yeah. So these are the kinds of things that she learned from people. But what she produced was really her her own talent and her own way of uh, working. Yeah, we have, um, oh, they're probably about, we have two big wood pieces that she painted on. Um, they're probably like 15 inches long. Oh, I say that's they're pretty, longer than what I have. Yeah, they're, they're pretty big. Um, and then we have smaller ones too. Yeah. That she did. And that's um, often what she would make for Mennonite neighbors who would mm-hmm. hang them in in certain kinds of uh, living parlor places. And they often had a homiletic kind of message. And Mm -hmm. she was uh, very sincere and uh, very ethical in, in what she did. Yeah. Um, So that's all the questions that I have. Do you have anything that you wanted to add? Well, I'm very happy for the attention that she's received. I think in addition to the folk art world and the Mennonite world, I think it also says a lot about the expressiveness Mm -hmm. of people. And I think also uh, for women's work as well. She took uh, great pride as, as you saw in, 
pumpkin raising pumpkins <laughs> and the quilting yeah. and the kinds of everyday work that we might think is routine, but uh, she showed how indeed significant they are mm -hmm. to our lives and our perceptions of community and traditional lives, particularly at a time when we feel so mobile and, and so individualized. Uh, she gave us not only a document of social history, but an appreciation for that life as well. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else? Uh, just that I'd now I have to come to Napanee <laughs> to see your permanent exhibition. I mean, she produced a lot. It was her work. I tried to collect what I have, and there is repetition in her work. But I saw in what you sent me, there are also some distinctive pieces that I don't remember, and I'd mm -hmm. love to see them. I hope they're being taken care of because again she didn't work with fancy materials her canvases i think she probably bought from walmart or or somewhere oh. they were very generic yeah. kinds of canvases and the paints mm -hmm. she uh, didn't have a lot of money and uh, she bought what what she could so i worry also about their condition now that i realize that's 50 years ago when yeah. <laughs> I, I went to see her yeah, no, um, we, when we actually acquired the collection, we sent out five to a conservator, uh, an art conservator that we were really, that were really unstable and that we were concerned about. Um, and they did really excellent work on them. And then right. um, they're actually on a schedule of, um, we evaluate them and then whatever one we have concern about, they go out to our conservator. Fantastic. I, I appreciate that. Again, to me, they're not folk in the sense of being lesser. To me, they're fine art and, and great mm -hmm. documents, uh, as well as great personal testimonies. So her life has meaning and will continue on. Yeah, she is. Um, in, adding, in adding her to our museum, we've gotten a lot more attention because people find out that we have collections of her work um, and being as many paintings as what we have, they, they come to look at them. Yeah. 60 is impressive. <laughs> I think the Indiana university museum might've had a dozen. Uh, in fact, yeah. I did an exhibit for them before I started writing with labels that would try and describe what I found out from her. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 60 probably is the largest and I'm, um, I'm glad you're going to be a repository for them. Yeah, and that's an opportunity, to, again, to see the whole gamut of work. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, when I'm, even in the article, when I mentioned some of the other kinds of work she did, besides the paintings of everyday life, people are sometimes surprised that she was mm -hmm. engaged in in that much. But again, it was the the value or the virtue of handwork that was indeed important. Mm -hmm. And there is also a value in educating. So while it's true, the Mennonite and the Amish communities are self-contained, uh, that, that doesn't mean that they don't want to describe their lives to others. And that's also yeah. part of the justification she had of selling these things to the English, not only for her work, but also if it hangs in their home, they'll learn something that Mennonite life is a living tradition, which is yeah. something she was concerned about. It's not just some relic of the 19th century. They were living it in the 20th century and still in the 21st, and it has uh, value in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we do have like a, we have panel, we have educational panels in her area. So we have one that kind of explains the Anabaptism and the differences between the Amish and the Mennonites. Um, but then we also did receive um, quite a bit of funding to do educational resources. So we hope to develop um, things for kids like coloring books of her paintings, um, fun little uh, find and seeks. Um, we do have an escape room that yeah. is... Um, centralized around all of our paintings and then people learn more about emma as they go 
Well, that's great. Also involved in public education. So I think part of the message for the children's activities Mm -hmm. that you mentioned that is great is, is that, you know, the, in education today, children often learn that what is famous or what is important happens somewhere else, right? Yeah. It's in DC (laughs) or it's in New York or LA. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that exercise that you're talking about is saying, here's somebody who's celebrated right here in our backyard. And what Mm -hmm. was she known for, but depictions of things that I know, and I hope this will spur children and then as adults and college students to document themselves. Yeah. They have access to information and culture, which we need to preserve. And certainly we need to document. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bronner. And as you said, you're really busy. So I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to me. And um, it is great to meet you virtually. Hopefully we can meet in person if you come down and see us. I'm planning on it. Thank you again. Well, thank you so much. Well, that's all that we have for this episode. A special thank you to Alita and Dr. Bronner for being my guest. Next month, we'll have Napanee photographer Dale Tobias on the podcast to talk about photography. But before you go, please be sure to subscribe to this podcast, hit like, or leave us a comment.